Thank you, Sister Hawken. Thank you, Elden Zemiri, for that uh, powerful message, um, which really reminds us of the ploys of the evil one, his fight against God by attacking his law. Um, as we transition to the uh, our study phase, Shall we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the testimony of your word. We want to thank you because your word is true and can be trusted. And as we have seen, the evil one is uh, at war with you through attacking the two institutions that you gave uh, men for their enjoyment and to remind themselves of who you are. As we transition to our study yesterday, we were discussing how even the spirit of prophecy is being attacked because it's a, a light, it shines a light into your word. Help us to be diligent to be students of the Bible so that we will not be shaken. Now, as we resume our study uh, on chapter 25 of Desire of Ages, we want to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to uh, guide this study, to teach us and to lead us into all truth is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Right. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to our study of Chapter 25 of the Desire of Ages. Um, I think we'll jump right into this study, or maybe let us sing so that uh, people may stretch themselves as we sing, so that, because I think we've been sitting for, for long. Let us sing number six in the SDA hymn now, Oh, Worship the Lord. Uh, we'll ask for volunteers. There are four verses. Uh, who would like to sing the first verse? Number six in the Advent hymn now, Oh, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness. So there are four verses there. I'll sing the first verse. Thank you, Sister Eileen. And the second verse. I'll take the second one, sis. Thank you very much, Sister Hope. The third verse. I'll take the third verse. Uh, so the final verse. I could try. I'm not sure if I know. Thank you, Sister Judith. <clears throat> My voice is not particularly good this morning, so I will be trying to to be a joyful sound to the Lord. Okay, shall we sing in that order? Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holy name. Bow down before him, his glory proclaim. With gold of obedience and incense of loneliness. Kneel and adore him, the Lord is his name. Low at his feet, lay the burden of carefulness. High on his heart, he will bear it for thee. Comfort thy sorrows and answer thy prayerfulness, guiding thy steps as may best for thee be. Mr. Judith? Okay, sorry. Fear not, 
To enter and die is called sin, the splendorness of the poor world thou would reckon as thine. Truth in its beauty and love in its tenderness. These are the offerings to lay on his shrine. <clears throat> These though we bring them in trembling and fearfulness, he will accept for the name that is dear. Mornings of joy give for evenings of tearfulness. Trust for our trembling and hope for our fear. Amen. 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 Father, as we uh, resume our study of the desire of ages, we just want to thank you for the spirit of prophecy which shines a light to the Bible. Uh, help us, Lord, not to be uh, deceived by the enemy who is kindling a hatred for the spirit of prophecy amongst your remnant people. Help us, Lord, to be edified by the writings which lead us to the greater light. And as we continue our study of the call by the sea, my prayer is that we each may individually heed to the call that you have given uh, for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay. So yesterday, um, we had a detour, which really wasn't a detour because it was really a very important question that was discussed. Um, uh, okay, I can't see the sister who had raised the question, but uh, uh, I'm sure we're all blessed by the question and the answers that were given. The question for those who were not with us yesterday is, was, is what is wrong with reading other authors? for example, Joyce Mayer, in place of or alongside Ellen White. Um, yeah. Yeah, and there was also the concern that Ellen White's writings were being elevated to biblical writings. I believe we thoroughly, well, we may not have thoroughly exhausted that topic, but I believe we all benefited from that topic. And my takeaway really from that was, which was always my stance was, if we know there is truth in Ellen White and we believe from the biblical test of a prophet that she was indeed an inspired, she, what would be the point of uh, looking at other authors if we can see that they, there are some errors in their teachings. Uh, and my stance was that there are so many writings of Sister White, which I haven't read. I really haven't got the time to sift through the errors in the other author's writings. Anyway, we will pack that one there for now and continue uh, in our reading, unless there are any 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 uh, comments on that? I don't see any hands up, so we shall continue with our reading. Okay, we are in chapter twenty-five. A call, the call by the sea. Uh, just a brief synopsis of the chapter. Uh, <clears throat> We see uh, uh, Jesus going to the seaside at the crack of dawn for a quiet time away from the multitudes who thronged around him. He finds his disciples in a boat, fishing boat, where they had spent the whole night trying to fish, but without any success. And so he starts, uh, as he gets there, the crowd follow him because, I mean, he, 
yeah, they pressed about him. So he asked the uh, disciples to move a bit out, away from the shore and he taught them. And I mean, as he taught them, uh, she says he had other audiences in, my, in mind. That is you and me who would be edified by his word. And when he had finished teaching, he tells the disciples, he tells Peter to launch into the deep, to uh, cast his net into the water. And Peter says, we've worked all night and there was nothing. But because you say so, at thy word, I will let down the net, Peter says. And it says, she continues to say that it was love for his master that led the disciples, Peter, to obey. Because, I mean, Peter was an experienced fisherman and he knew that, I mean, night was the best. Well, the current knowledge, I mean, all fishermen knew that night is the best time to fish. This was no time to fish, but he went ahead and obeyed and he, there was such a heavy haul of fish as a result of his obedience. And it's and 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 when Peter realized that he was in the presence of divinity, he he realized how undone, how unholy he was. And um Sister White also gives um uh, uh, two other examples in the Bible of people who, when they encountered God, realized how unholy they were. Daniel is one of them. Uh, after his uh, fasting, when uh, he had an encounter with God, the other other one is Isaiah, when he met God at the temple. Anyway, it says that. Um, Soon after the catch, this miraculous catch of fish, the disciples decided to be full-time followers of Christ. Yeah. And yeah, these people, he, he chose unlearned men, but because God will qualify whomsoever he chooses and whomsoever wants to follow him, he chose these men in place of the rabbis of the day, some of whom were listening to his teaching and believed his teaching because they scorned, they actually scorned, uh, they scorned him and uh, scorned to be taught by Christ because he hadn't gone to the rabbinical schools. Yeah. That is really a brief synopsis of how far we have got. And so today we are starting his elder desire here today. I would ask him to please share our reading or anybody else who has the book to share it, that would be very helpful because I do not have paragraph numbers in my book, but I can check on my phone what paragraph we are at now where we ended, not yesterday, but the day before yesterday. While I'm checking, I don't, I wonder if there's anyone who has a uh, any comments on what we have covered so far or any burning thoughts they were not able to share. In chapter 25, um, we're beginning with the paragraph which begins with Jesus chose and learned fishermen. I'm not sure what paragraph it is. Um, 
It's paragraph 250.1. Thank you very much, uh, Elder, for sharing that screen. I will ask a reader to please read that paragraph to 50.1. I don't know if you if you'd be able to uh, zoom on, on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Could I have a reader, please? Uh, read that. Jesus um, chose an electrician. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of nativity ability, and they were humble and teachable men whom he could educate for his work. In the common works of life, there's many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his collabor collaborators. And he, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's greatest men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Hmm. Okay, so he chose men who were humble and teachable. Uh, that reminds me, there is a text that a humble and contrite heart God will not despise. Common men who needed uh, the touch of a skillful hand to arouse their dormant faculties. I believe that really is the Holy Spirit working on the heart. And these are the people who turned the world out upside down as a result of associating with Jesus. That paragraph is so packed. Uh, we'll pause there for some moment of reflection. If anyone has any reflection on that. And... Yeah, I think if you if you look at it, uh, sis, um, it's, it's, it's really pumped because the people that God chose to take the message are common men. And the Bible, I mean, the, 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 the pen of inspiration is very clear where it says they were unlearned. They didn't have all these so-called degrees. But yet these are the people that turned the world upside down as you said it. <clears throat> These are the people that we are reading about today. How they worked for God. How they went into these unentered areas. And they worked so hard to the point of even losing their lives working for God. God was their school master, the, the school teacher. He's the one who mentored them. And you find out that the, the foundation of this 
church, our church. Back in the days, the, the pastors were not chosen because of how many degrees they have. Because pastoral ministry is not a job. They say it is a calling. Therefore, you would find out that uh, before, I'm talking of way before, before one became a pastor to lead a district, they will start working. Sometimes they start working like uh, literature evangelists or sometimes they start working. They start just like in an ordinary uh, evangelist working with the people. And the church seeing the zeal, that person could be a young person, has towards the work of God, how passionate they are in the word. Through the Holy Spirit helping the church to see the ability of this young man or they will then make a recommendation to the body that uh, we think this one can be a pastor. And then they will be given a district to start working on. Could be one, two, three churches, four churches, five churches. And they will be going from one church to another. And from there, they will go to the college to learn more. in the pastoral ministry. But things have changed now that it's the other way around that people, they first go to the college and then they come to lead God's people. If you look at the difference there, is that what we have today it's more of administrators who comes to administer at church level. And majority of them, they come as workers. They've come in to the ministry as a job, not a calling. Mm. And that's why you see today, Sorry that I'm, I'm I'm just saying this as as true as it is. Maybe in some districts it's different. You have a pastor at the church. He will be there probably for three, four, five years, but they've never entered their foot into your home to come and pray with you, to come and encourage you. They've never done that. Yet, if you look at the generation that is leaving us now, they will come in your house to pray with you. And some will even say, if you are not at your house, if you are at work, just leave your keys somewhere. I will come into your house and pray for your house. That's a calling. So, the, the quality of the generation that is leaving us now is completely different with the quality of generation that we have today. Today for you to go and study for pastoral ministry, you need to have a master's degree. And they don't, I don't think they ask where did you attain this, your master's degree in religious studies. You can attain it to any from any institution. It could be a Sunday keeping institution. It could be any other institution. As long as you have that, then you have that's your entry requirement to become a pastor. Which is completely different. So that's what I'm saying. This is this has changed the dynamics of this church. If you look at the disciples, sorry for taking long, the disciples, when they were called, 
They didn't have any degree. They didn't have any kind of, um, uh, uh, or even gone, have, uh, actually gone through a higher learning institution. But Christ looked at the passionate, the passion that they had for the work that they were doing, especially the fishermen, the patience. And he took them and trained them to become the disciples who will turn this world upside down. So in actual fact, to become a pastor is not a job, but is a calling. But we have made it now a job instead of a calling. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Elder Zunil. As you are speaking, you know, it reminds me that, you know, in this multitude that was uh, listening to Jesus by the sea, it says they were the learned, the rich and the learned were there. There were even some rabbis there, but they did not, they did not, they did not follow Christ. So, yeah, I'm just agreeing with you that even with a degree, that does not mean that you have been qualified by Christ. Thank you very much for that. Uh, insight. Good morning, Sister Kezia. Please go ahead. Yeah, good morning, Sister Martha, and uh, everybody on the platform, and happy Sabbath to you all. Yes, I just wanted to comment on the same lines as well that these, these fishermen, the, the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. Therefore, even us, when we go to these uh, schools, if we look at the education system of the world, you will see that it actually corrupts the mind. It actually takes away the simplicity of in your mind. Therefore, it, to undo that corruption, it takes a long, long, long time because it's Babylon knowledge. Yes, we can learn how to read and write, which is very good. But there are other things which, which they saw in the brains of, you know, of our children, which corrupts the mind. In, in such a way that to undo that really takes time. You look at uh, Moses because he had been trained in the Egyptian uh, customs and military and everything, how long did it take for God to equip him to be able to lead the children of Israel? 40 years. 40 years to take out all that. This is why even in our days now, we see these pastors they will be quoting examples of you know people of the world because that's what they are used to. They, it's there is that a uh, corruption from the system of what they are learning and the things which they are admiring are things of this world and and so forth. So that you hear them quoting people like Bill Gates on the platform, whatever, and you start wondering, really, is that admirable? You know. Because the system of this world corrupts the mind, is the worldly systems. So they have got nothing to do with spiritual. Uh, uh, and as a result, they, it, it makes somebody think that um, they, they are sufficient, they are eloquent to speak, they can do this, not depending on the Holy Spirit because they have got this master's degree, they've got this, so they can speak to any crowd. They can study and then speak. The Holy Spirit and prayer is set aside. It's all about now self. And it is, it is very, it is, it's a subtle thing which the enemy has brought into our church. In contrast mm -hmm. with, you know, the writings which we are reading right now, we are studying. God used Sister White, who had only gone to three grades of school. It's only up to three grader. Her hand was feeble. 
everything, you know, there was nothing about her. Even her own looks had been, you know, she had been disfigured because of, of the accident she had. And God uses that humble, humble person. Therefore, when we have gone to these big schools and done the masters and so forth, we need to be even more careful to say, am I using my own uh, or am I being led by the Holy Spirit? We, we need to be even more prayerful to make sure that it is the Spirit who it is the Spirit who is leading you, not your own self uh, thoughts, which which will be in you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Kezia, for that. You know, as you were speaking, I was thinking of. I went to one of the big churches. I'm not going to say which church it was, and the pastor was using some slides, and at the bottom of the slides there were his qualifications. And I looked at him and he was actually looking at the camera because it was being recorded. And I said, wow, I don't think the audience in this church is his target audience. Anyway, uh, I will leave that there. Sister Dorothy, please go ahead. Thank you. Good Sister morning. Martha. Good morning, everyone. And happy Sabbath. Oh. Yes, um, I was just in this paragraph is so wonderful and I hope that we get encouraged by it. I like where it says that these men, they were men of native ability and they were humble and teachable. So I like this a lot because these men were not corrupted and because they were humble, they were able they were they were teachable because they were humble so to be able to be taught humility is very important humility is i think in this sense is someone who uh who recognize who recognizes that um who recognizes that what they are being taught is essential for their salvation and they have already they had already um witnessed that Christ was the savior because of the miracle that had been done Jesus was doing that deliberately so that they can gain more confidence in him as to who he was correct me if i am wrong there and and when he began to teach them, they they knew this was not just any teacher. They uh, they uh, they were able to tell uh, his mannerism, his wisdom, his knowledge. They were able to sit at his feet and be taught. And so it is for us today. the The messages that we have today. They are for people who are humble and teachable, especially Adventism is not for everybody. Some people, they will read it, they will mock it, but people who want to listen to the voice of Jesus and the spirit of prophecy, and when they listen and read Ellen G. White's books, they will know that these words are not words of men. They are inspired, yeah. and they will cling to the book get hold of them and they will treasure them like uh, precious uh, gold and run with it. And when we study and know what our message is, is to preach the three angels' messages, we will not allow anyone to, uh, to come in between us and what we have read and believe that God wants us to do. You know, Elders Nereus, you were talking he talked about uh, the tradition, Adventism, and how those men were just simple men, and God used them. And another man in my church, a, a faithful man of God, he was talking to me about the crisis in our church, about what's going on there, the pastor trying to lead the church in the wrong direction. And he said, you know, we when we go to church on the Sabbath, as members, 
we go to worship God. Everyone gets ready to go to worship God. But these ministers, the majority of them, they come to do a job because they are getting paid at the end of the month. And that really, that hit, that hit really, uh, it, it, it caused me to think it could be true because why would a minister like this sit down with church board and decide to disfellowship a sister who gave out a book during Health Expo, The Desire of Ages. And that's it. And since he has been there, no evangelism work had been done in that church, nothing at all. And I don't think I am, I, I don't think I'm unfair to, I, th I don't think it's unfair to say most of these ministers who have been taught in these schools, they can hardly preach, hardly preach. They just do talks from the pulpit and the church members, they just go home at the end of the Sabbath day. And I feel sad about that, really, really sad, because most people, they come to church to hear the word of God, but that's not exactly what we come to hear. Sorry for lingering on this for quite a long time. But I just want us to be encouraged today to know that if we are humble and teachable, the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Jesus is not here physically, but we have a teacher. Holy Spirit, my teacher be. So if we believe that, God will use us wherever we are. God will use us. Say, here I am, Lord, send me. And he will send you and me, and we will labor for Christ. If we are willing, he will use us. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Dorothy, for that powerful insight. Humble and teachable, God will use us. Uh, is that Elder Desire? Good morning. Please go ahead. Prayer Retreat Ministry. Good morning, good morning, Sister Martha. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Okay. I came in late. Uh, I feel I missed out a lot. Uh, thank you for all those comments. Um, I wanted to say um, on that uh, uh, paragraph that is highlighted in a bit of the next one, um, I was just thinking about, um, just to add to what has been said, um, I suppose uh, the way I am now, uh, uh, the, the 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 profession that I have chosen for myself now, I I can understand more uh, where this is coming from. Uh, uh, I I do help people to to uh, to learn to drive. Now I've always struggled with people, especially who have done some driving somewhere and they want now to take a license from this country. Um, there's a lot of unlearning that needs to take place for this because the way they drive, they drive the way they did probably in their country or the way their uncle taught them to drive. Now, I'm thinking this in spiritual matters, how difficult it must be for God to teach somebody who has had a lot of learning from this world. Because the world has its own teacher, its own source of information, and it's the devil. The devil is of this world, is the prince of this world. So the education of this world is inspired by the devil. Now we have God's education, true education, which is from another world altogether. It's the opposite. It's like East and West. These lessons of humility, you don't find them in the world. The lessons of patience, you don't find them in the world. The lessons of faithful, faithfulness, integrity, they are not there in the world. And so I'm just trying to think if it's difficult for us 
how much more difficult it is for God in spiritual things. As somebody said, Moses it had to take him uh, 40 years. But I also wanted to say, it must have been uh, easier for the Lord to train these men, humble fishermen, who had not been corrupted at all. And he's instilling in them the knowledge of God. There is no theories that have corrupted their understanding. And these people understood and they took it from Jesus. They learned, uh, uh, they were like, uh, uh, we call them apprentices for three and three and a half years. They were like apprentices. They were being taught and they were seeing from the uh, from the teacher of teachers. So it must have been um, a high privilege indeed for the for these disciples. So yeah, just wanted to to make that point. May God help us uh, to be humble. I think one of the lines was saying one of the first lessons that anybody should learn who come to Jesus is a lesson of self distrust. Now, when you've been educated in this world, this pride that I know always comes. It just floats somewhere, somewhere. You want to, to, to impress people with how literate you are on issues and how well read you are on certain issues. So the first lesson there, what took my attention is uh, self-distrust. Jeremiah says, cursed be the man that trusted in another man, that make it the arm of another man, his flesh, something along those lines. Now, sometimes we think Jeremiah is, is speaking of just trusting in another man. Now, there's an element with the education of this world, you're trusting the leading thinkers when you run with that education. But there's also an element of trusting in self that now I'm educated, now I'm able to do this. So that text is hitting both sides, which is the same thing Paul was saying, that I conferred not with flesh and blood. In Galatians 1 verse 10, he did not inquire from flesh. So may God help us. This is a big lesson that uh, many of us will have to learn, the lesson of self-distrust. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for, for that insight. Humility and being teachable. Um, yes, Brother Mfeki, you've got your hand up. Please go ahead. I'll ask you to be the last contributor okay. and also pray for us afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Uh, mine, mine was just going to be a question. Is okay. the education that we obtain in the world bad? Is the education we obtain in this world bad or evil? That's my question. Not only bad, but extremely bad. <laughs> well, um, I think we got to look at these uh, things in uh, uh, two different ways. <clears throat> in the sense that uh, we need to understand that God empowered people and uh, some of these educations that we receive today, uh, when you look to the author of those of that kind of education, is God. You look at science. Today we are sitting in. A, I I speak from the point of engineering because I studied engineering. You are seated there. You go onto your light bulb. I mean, to a switch and you turn on light. And there is light in your room. Uh, you look at how God has empowered people with the knowledge, the brains, just to go at a waterfall and put a, a generator there 
then begins to generate electricity that helps the entire population. That's world education. Is it good? Yes. Who authored it? It's God himself who gave the people that knowledge. But the, the knowledge that is bad or the education that is not right is the education that negates the existence of God. And part of this education comes back to the aspect of the religious education. It is out of the religious education that actually brings the, uh, the, the, the rebellion that we see today. But the other types of educations that we have, they are not bad. That's how I will look at it. But we have uh, some of the education that is authored by the devil himself to destroy the existence of God in human life. That is bad. Hmm. Today, yes. uh, my elder says he teaches people how to drive. Is, uh, is that kind of education better to be able to learn how to drive? No, it's not bad. It's okay. That's why you are in that kind of uh, work where you teach people how to drive. How did you become an instructor? You went to school and you learned about that and you became an, a, an, an in, in instructor. So we got to look at two different ways of we got to look at it in a you know you know differently. The aspect of the education that negates God, which is obviously the religious education, that is the one that is bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before you go, Brother Mfeki, let Sister, I think that Sister Sharon give her comment. <laughs> And then Elder Desire will give you a comment. That would be the absolute last one. And then Brother Mfeki will respond to that and close in prayer. We're running a bit thin on time. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, saints. Happy Sabbath. It is so easy to qualify the education system that we have. But we've got to realize there is a biblical true education. We can make do with the government system, but it is not true education because true education develops the spirit, the mind, the body for service for God. You can say that you're dedicating your degree to God, but the system is constantly attacking the values that you have as a Christian. When coming out of these systems, you may come out and say, thank you, God, that I have not lost my faith in you. But they have left slivers, and I say slivers, you know when you get a splinter into your finger, it leaves slivers of their system in you that you have to then spend your time counteracting. This is why God had to take um, Moses and work with him for 40 years, because those slivers amounted to a point where he became self-sufficient, self-dependent, and was just going like, so Lord, what should I do? Okay, is that the way you want it to be done? I'm going to do it my way. And then what happens is that when we get into these jobs and we set up our homes, we then perpetrate these same ideologies with our children. Our children now are becoming the second generation of those going into the system, but they're struggling to maintain the balance of their Christianity and education. And this is why we are having a falling away of our young people and they do not value biblical things. It's because those little slivers 
of the, the education systems that they leave in our, our, our mindset has encouraged them not to just come let us reason together, it's, it's encouraged them to think, why, is, why do we believe in God when science shows us otherwise? Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Sister Sharon. Yeah. Yes, uh, I think Sister Sharon is summed up. I'll just read this uh, quotation the, uh, from education. Uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, Sister White, uh, under inspiration, wrote many, many books on the subject of education. There's uh, this education, fundamentals of true education, testimonies on education, councils on teachers and so, so there's um, a lot more that we can um, go and um, uh, uh, and learn from. And just one quick illustration as well before I read this text. You know, the question that elders ask is extremely important. And uh, it is the reason that, uh, uh, it is the reason as to uh, why we are where we are now. It is because this question is still in our minds and it's so vivid in our minds is the education of the world back and it's still in the minds of our children and our young people even our adults um now if you had if you were so hungry and uh, you find an apple which is three quarters rotten and one quarter is still looking good. Would you take that apple to eat? I'm sure if you are hungry, maybe you would probably sacrifice to eat a quarter bit or a half bit, which is. But would that, in your assessment, would you say the apple is good? I think probably you'd say the opposite. Now, this is what I think is with the the with the education of the world that we have i mean it's not so much as to some goods or some goodies that we can take away from this education and there's something that you can take away yeah i would like to agree with my elder definitely um there's some little things here and there that you can take away and that is um, help on um, helping us with our livelihoods, but here the question has to go to the root. Um, uh, before we do the screening and the filtering and taking this and leaving that, uh, where is it issuing from? Is 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 the issue? And I think this is what Sister White was addressing in all her books when she was writing on this subject. Now it says here. Our ideas of education take too narrow and too low a range. There is need of a broader scope and higher aim. True education means more than the pursuit of a certain course of study. It means more than a preparation for the life that now is. It has to do with the whole being and with the whole period of existence possible to man. It is the harmonious development of the physical, like what Sister was saying, mental and the spiritual powers. It prepares the student for the joy of service in this world and for the higher joy of wider service in the world to come. Now, if education is only focusing on life that now is, and we are happy to have it because it focuses on the now, uh, then we have a lot more to catch up because unfortunately this is what this world is doing. The little good that you have, it helps you only for this life. Unless we turn our heads and lift our heads and look for a better education from the world above, uh, we will uh, perish in this world. Uh, uh, I mean, Sister Sharon, I think she has said uh, most of the things I want to say. I'll stop there. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Yeah. 
I think we'll have Elder Mfeki uh, yeah. conclude and pray. <laughs> okay, um, thank you very much. I I agree with Elder Tsimiri. We, we, when we talk of education, we need to be practical. There is education that benefits us while we are on this planet. Then there is the education we need of how to get into the other world, into the next world, and how to live between now and the next world. That's the education we need. For instance, you and I right now are talking. I'm miles away from you. That technology we are using came as a result of somebody going to school, of somebody being educated. For you and I to understand how the body functions physically, somebody went to school and was educated. And they can tell you in minute detail, up into the cellular level, what is happening to you physically. When you eat food, when you drink water, when you do a certain activity, that education we need. The education we do not need is the education that does not help us to live the life that God has already instructed people that we should live. We don't need that education. Education that just glorifies man, we don't need it. But education that helps us to survive in the world we are and then helps us to get into the kingdom come, we need that education. So when we talk of education, we need to separate the education we need as God's people to live in this world and to prepare us for the world to come. We need that. The education we do not need is the education that glorifies man. Education that helps you to exploit other people. We don't need to learn about that education. However, education per se is not bad. The disciples we are talking about were educated because they had the technical ability to be fishermen. You don't just get out of your bed and walk into a boat, into a boat, into the sea and start fishing. You need to have some sort of education. So I don't think education as it is, it is bad. It is what we need to understand is when we are receiving the education, is this helping me to prepare me for the life that I'm living now and the life I'm to live in the kingdom come? Or this is just extra information that does not help me to love God with all my soul, love my neighbor as myself. That's how I think we should look at education because sometimes we sound as if everything we're learning in the world is bad. When in reality, some of it is good, it's good for us. I've given you the example of technology. You and I are using it. The people who learned it probably had no idea that some Christian somewhere will use this same material, this system, to preach the gospel. But you and I had to be educated on how to use that technology in order to further the gospel. So we can't condemn it and say it is bad. Because we are also benefiting from it. So we need to separate when we talk of education. We need to make a difference between that which is helpful which, which prepares us for the kingdom to come and the life we ought to live as God's people. And that which really glorifies man and the glory of this world. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for blessing us. Giving us this time to study your word, dear Lord. There are many things we will need to learn, some of them very, very quickly. Some of them we need to unlearn because we were taught in the wrong way. And we need to unlearn them and learn them again in the correct way. Open our minds, help us to understand. Not only the times we are living in now, but the preparation that is needed for the kingdom to come. Now, as we go to our different places of worship, may you help us to be light 
in those areas. Bring the truth of God to those places of worship. Bring to us somebody who is hungering from somebody who wants to understand. Somebody who's got questions. Help us to be the people, the instruments you will use to provide the answers so that they can remain holding on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And thank you all for, for joining us in this study and apologies for